No, everybody. I do not have any announcements at the top, so we can get right to questions. I was just going to launch in halfway through. But, uh, You're going to what? Go on, Turkey. Uh, Turkey all right, well, you, had, you had your hand up. Go ahead. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, today, just this morning, or a couple hours ago, uh, editor in chief of uh, Jumurate Daily, Turkish Daily, attacked uh, by a gunman. Uh, do you have a comment, first of all, on this? No, look, I'm just seeing press reports about this myself. And so it, uh, uh, I think we're just going to watch this as closely as we can, but I don't have an official comment on it right now. Uh, uh, but you have seen that the, the incident happened. Uh, do you think I have seen press reports about an incident. I don't have operational reports to speak to about it. Uh, so I'm going to refrain from specific comments until, until we have more information. I just don't have anything more for you. On that. The fighting in Hama prison in Syria. Uh, we've seen uh, reports of that as well. Um, and we're certainly uh, uh, concerned about that. Um, uh, we would urge the regime to refrain from actions that could escalate uh, the violence and the tension. And I understand that there's already been some violence here. I'm not saying there hasn't been. Um, and uh, as always, we call on Russia and uh, uh, other partners uh, that have influence on the regime to press, to press them for uh, restraint. Um, and I might take this opportunity to simply say that we also call on the regime uh, to, uh, to treat appropriately those people that are being detained. There's a, we, you could easily have a fundamental debate about whether they should be detained or not, and, uh, and, and certainly we have concerns over uh, the detentions. But separate and distinct from that, there's an obligation if you're going to have people detained in a prison, there's an obligation that a government incurs upon itself uh, in terms of assuring their well-being. And so uh, we're going to, you know, we certainly ca call on them to, to, to respect that obligation. Uh, do you have any update on the uh, alleged bombing of the IDP camp in northern Syria? I gather the Syrians and the Russians have denied having anything to do with it, but it's apparently an airstrike. Yeah, I would tell you that uh, we're still processing information um, about that incident, and there's uh, we, we don't have perfect knowledge about what happened. Uh, so uh, we're, we're still uh, doing the best we can to, to try to get more information and, and more accurate information uh, about what happened. What is the status of the ceasefire of the truce. The Revolution. cessation of hostilities in, in Aleppo. That's what you meant to ask, I think. No, I meant to ask. <laughs> I, I don't like the word cessation of hostilities. I know you don't. I'm not sure I know you it, don't. It, it doesn't, it apparently doesn't mean cessation of hostilities. It means No. It, it does. It, no, that's why it I does, said truce. It does. Well, it does mean that, though. It does. It does anyway, mean that, and, it, and anyway, that's what we're trying to achieve. And so, to answer your so question, so it's supposed to. So, by your count, if you, since yesterday you guys accepted, or Mark accepted, that it was forty-eight hours that the Syrians had agreed to, and by your definition of when that started, it would have been over last night at midnight local time. By their definition, the Syrians' definition, it would be over tonight, midnight time. Is it still on, according to you? Because according to you, it would have been over last night, and it hasn't. But well, what we right. – uh, right. So obviously what we want and desire is for these, these cessations to be enduring. Um, and what I can tell you is – a, we continue to watch uh, the situation in Aleppo. It does appear as if the violence has uh, decreased since it came into effect a couple of days ago, and that seems to be the case today. I, I, I can't tell you that it's perfect in every neighborhood of Aleppo. Of course not. Uh, and obviously the right number of violations is zero. That's what we want. Uh, we're still concerned about reports of violations. But in general, since the, it went into effect two days ago, uh, we have seen a, a decreased level of violence in Aleppo, and okay. we'd like to see that continue. Right. But are there active efforts underway now to extend it beyond what the Syrians say would be the, the end of it? Well, I don't want to get ahead of diplomatic discussions. I can tell you that we very much, the United States, very much would like to see it endure and, and go beyond uh, what were, uh, what were well, uh, stated time limits. Based on what you know, what are the chances of that? I don't – I think I don't want to – I'm not going to speculate in terms of uh, the chances of uh, of being able to go forward with it. I, I think – I don't know that would be useful to, to, 
to do. What, what I can tell you is we're committed to seeing it endure, and uh, and we're going to continue to have discussions with the partners in the ISSG um, to try to see that it can okay, endure. I'm not asking you to speculate about it. I'm saying well, based said, what on the what chances? you know, based on what you know, or what this building knows from here from people in Geneva and potential conversations that the secretary or other officials may have had with the Russians. What are, you know, are you optimistic that there will, that you'll be able to get an extension? I, I would say that we're, uh, we're committed to making it endure and, um, and we're very focused on, uh, on trying to see if that reduction in violence can be sustained. Have the Russians said whether they're going to, it's going to endure. The I, Russians I, announced I, it as a 40 analysis I'm not, I, I'm not aware of any additional comments out of uh, Moscow. You'd have to talk to them and about that. They have, you, when was the last time Secretary Kerry spoke to Brett from Mr. Lavrov? Uh, hang on a second. Last call I have on record was Monday, the 2nd of May, before it went into effect. John. Yes. Can I uh, just uh, follow up? Now, your counterpart, uh, the uh, Russian foreign, and, uh, foreign ministry, Maria Zakharova, said today that basically it was the terrorist, what she called the terrorist, that time and again broke, broke the uh, ceasefire before. And she uh, noted uh, what happened on May 1 and uh, May 3rd and so on. And she's saying basically it is Jabhat al Nusra and others who have been trying to frustrate or to break the, the, the hudna, you know, the cessation of hostilities since uh, since it went in effect on last February. So do you have any comment on that? Well, it's an interesting comment to make because they're not parties to the cessation of hostilities. <laughs> Designated but, terrorist groups are not parties so, to it. So but, but, nobody ever expected them to observe it. Okay. But so uh, then, then she said that that made them, you know, a fair target by government forces and so on. You know, so... Uh, when you say that they are not part of the, the cessation, then they are fair target. Then the government has, or everybody else, much as like the coalition or you know, the Russians and so on, has every right to go ahead and bomb them, right? They're not. They're not. A, they're not a party to the cessation, so they are. They are fair targets okay. for kinetic strikes. Yeah. Okay. And that includes the areas that may not be delineated between this this group or that group and so on. If. We've talked about this before, Saeed. I understand. I, I mean, I, 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 I know, but I, I, yeah. I feel like sometimes we're retreading the same ground over right. and over again. Right. There, I'm not disputing the fact that, that in Aleppo, these groups can be intermingled. Um, in fact, sometimes it's by design, especially by groups like al-Nusra that want to help try to protect themselves by being geographically close uh, or inter intermixed with, uh, with groups that either civilians or opposition groups that they know are parties mm -hmm. to the cessation of hostilities. I'm also not saying, and never have said, that there haven't been violations of the cessation by, by, uh, by certain members of the opposition. There has been. That said, by and large, the violations have been as a result of the regime. Um, and what, what we've asked, certainly in our conversations with Russia particularly, is that, that um, if they are going to undertake strikes, uh, which they have, against al-Nusra and against Daesh, that they do so with uh, as much precision as they can so that they are just hitting those groups and not anybody else. Uh, I can't say with, uh, you know, with certainty that that has always been the case, that, uh, that there haven't been in these strikes also uh, uh, strikes against uh, the opposition and against civilians. And on the regime side, we can say definitively we know uh, that the regime has not abided by the cessation particularly there in Aleppo, and has deliberately, on purpose, gone out and struck civilian uh, targets and opposition targets. Okay. But it's a very it's a very fluid situation there, very dynamic, which is why, quite frankly, it was, uh, uh, it was so important for us to get this reaffirmation in place a couple of days ago in, in Aleppo. Now, uh, I did one quick follow-up on what somebody that Mark said yesterday, that it was unacceptable uh, to have the regime retake Aleppo and so on, something to that. Uh, effect. Uh, does that mean there ought to be some sort of lines of demarcation between the between government troops and the other groups that ought to be recognized by those involved, like you, like the Russians, like whoever is involved in this and process? That, we're not we're not looking at the cessation in terms of lines of demarcation. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. Can I ask you about the um, so 
Is, is this issue of the 48 hours being cleared up? Uh, if the military said that it was 48 hours and the State Department said it's open-ended, can we assume that this truce continues? I think that was sort of the line of questioning that uh, I just went through with Matt. We would like to see it endure. Um, uh, I understand uh, uh, what some of the understandings were at the outset. Um, and again, I'd say over the last two days, we have seen a reduction in the violence. And I think that gives us some reason to be uh, uh, to be encouraged that uh, that if it can endure, uh, we may continue to see even more of a reduction in the violence. But I, I couldn't possibly predict um, that certainty or for how long that might be able to go. What we would like to see, and we said it from the very beginning, when the cessation was first put in place, uh, that we that, that our goal, our objective, our desire would be to see that it be enduring, that it be long-lasting, permanent, sustainable. I mean, obviously, that's what you want. You, you want to see the violence come down. So was this a lack of communication between you and the Russians? I don't think it was a lack of communication. I mean, I think uh, th there were pretty um, uh, serious uh, discussions that went on uh, between us and the Russians with respect to getting this this latest reaffirmation of the of the hostilities, the restoration, if you will, uh, in Aleppo, getting that in place and 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 uh, and, uh, and trying to get it to stick, and and in the process of doing that, you, you know, uh, uh, it's natural to, you know, especially because you're looking at a, a specific geographic area, it's natural to want to to try to bound that in some way so that you can get a deal in place that can be enforced, and we did, and there has been, as I said, a reduction in the violence. Uh, but we, uh, for our part, we, when we've said this from the beginning, I'm not saying something different to you than, than what we've said in the room. We want to see this be enduring. We, ultimately, we don't want to see time limits on this. So when we look at this if, as outsiders and we evaluate whether this truce is holding or not, we look at the levels of violence. Is, is that what you're saying we should do? The, the levels of violence, yes. I mean, overall. The, and when I, yeah, overall, but most specifically, the, you know, and I hate to put adjectives on it, but the or organized violence that you would see uh, uh, from um, where, where you see the cessation not happening or not succeeding. It's this, it's, you know, it's the regime against opposition or against civilians. It's, uh, um, and it's, and it's uh, violations of, of other groups that, that are causing that are causing these deaths and these injuries. And can I ask one more question? With the um, task force and, and evaluating the violations, is does the U.S. and Russia coordinate? And I mean, would would you have to show your hand as where the opposition is based, and they would have to show their hand where the government is based? Is that not kind of? Well, I don't think there's any question shown. about where the government is operating out of. But um, but and I don't want to get into the um, you know tactical level detail here of, how, uh, of the information flow, but it, it is true that um, that the U.S. side and the Russian side are in direct communication um, around the clock now um, about the situation, particularly in Aleppo. Um, to, and, and, and the purpose of that round the clock communication is to do exactly that, to, 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 to make sure that violations don't occur. and. Um, and then when they appear to be or appear to maybe be in the future, to try to forestall that by sharing information as appropriate uh, to keep it from happening. If, if the 48 hours ceasefire or cessation of hostilities is not renewed at midnight Syrian time, so in a few hours, does that mark a failure for this policy and of the mechanism that you've chosen? I, I, what I would say is, uh, number one, we want to see it continue. Um, we wanted to see it be uh, sustainable and enduring. Uh, that it has led to, for the first time now in weeks, a, a reduction in the violence in Aleppo is, is a good thing. Uh, and uh, again, we're encouraged by that. Being and it, t it, it, tells us, it tells us that it is possible to get to a better outcome in, in Aleppo. It tells us that it is, in fact, possible for Russia to exert 
the appropriate kind of influence on the Assad regime so that regime attacks can stop. So it, it certainly is an indicator that, um, that this approach can work. Uh, and I, I think what I would say gives us hope that it, it's worth continuing to try to pursue that and to keep it going. But if the regime is listening to you now, I assume they are, uh, they might see this as, in the, uh, as proof that they can string you along for 48 hours from time to time and you'll continue to say that you believe the process has got potential. Well, look, you do what you have to do to stop the bloodletting, um, particularly where you see it in places like Aleppo. Um, but that doesn't mean that um, uh, that we're interested in some sort of long-term plan to do this in, you know, piecemeal. What I've said from bef earlier is, you know, we want to see all of Syria to uh, uh, to be a peaceful environment. We don't want to see any Syrians coming under attack from their own government. How long are you prepared to tolerate the piecemeal approach? We are, we certainly are prepared to keep working this very hard, very hard for as long as it takes to try to get but you just said to you try to get wouldn't tolerate a, a long term hang on a second. as long as it takes your question was how long are we going to uh, work towards mm -hmm. keeping the cessation in place and we'll do that for as long as it takes what we want to see is the cessation of hostilities inter nationwide and to be sustainable over the long term um, I'm not going to speculate from here uh, about what happens um, in another 12 or 18 hours um, if, in fact, the Syrian regime considers the, 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 the time frame started later than what we did. Um, I what I can tell you is, you know, I think it's about six, what I can tell you, or whatever, yeah. what I can tell you is we're committed to keeping this in place as long as possible. That's the, that's the focus. And not just in Aleppo, but throughout the whole country. Uh, on the IDP uh, camp, the Russian military official said that, uh, judging by destruction of uh, the refugee camp, Nusra Front militants could have deliberately or accidentally fired on it. Do you have any information that confirmed this statement? No. Nope. And do you think that Nusra w was behind the, uh, behind firing on the camp? I don't have any information that that indicates that, as I said at the outset, we're still gathering information right now and, and are not in a position to definitively say exactly what happened there. Uh, sec second question. Um, Though you already asked two. No, this was one. <laughs> no, that was the two. The first one was a question, the second was a follow-up. Now the second question. The Syrian coalition uh, issued a statement today saying that the massacre perpetrated by the Assad regime against civilians in the IDP Kamuna camp in rural Idlib could have been prevented had U.S. President Barack Obama approved the establishment of a safe zone in northern Syria. What do you think about this statement? Well, again, we're still trying to get better information about what happened in the Idlib camp, so I'm not going to go any further on the circumstances there. We just don't have perfect knowledge right now. The issue of Safe zones, buffer zones, whatever you want to call them. We've talked about that uh, for quite some time, Michelle. I don't have anything new to add to uh, to what we've said in the past. Um, uh, that uh, uh, we continue to uh, examine and consider all manner of options and all alternatives. Uh, it would be irresponsible not to, but there's no change uh, to our view at this time uh, that. Uh, safe zones or buffer zones are not the appropriate response to take right now, and there there are there are there are risk and resource intensive issues that that uh, must be considered before you en enact uh, an approach like that, uh, and we have to be mindful of them. My third question is: Will the secretary uh, participate in the meeting on Syria on, in Paris next Monday? I don't have uh, any updates to offer on his uh, schedule for next week. Because French uh, uh, France Foreign Ministry has announced that uh, United States uh, will be part of the meeting, and uh, uh, Britain, Germany, Italy, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Qatar, Jordan, Turkey will, will be there too. I I don't have. Any updates to his schedule to announce right now? <coughs> Pam? One on Syria and two on Iraq. Um, Syria, this is a follow-up to David's question. I, I understand that the U.S. is interested in a broad nationwide ceasefire in Syria as a whole, 
But as you do these localized agreements, um, such as what you have in place in Aleppo, the ones that were enacted last week in um, Latakia, um, it, is there a limit on how long you're willing to consider trying with these localized ceasefires? It, it, is there a point that you get to where these localized ceasefires with four to eight hour deadlines just it becomes futile and difficult to, or too difficult I think this to gets, it's the same question that Dave asked, okay? I mean, I, I don't know how I can approach this any differently. Uh, uh, we're, so let's back up just a little bit here. We want to see the entire country safe and secure for the Syrian people. We want to see the cessation of hostilities, which applied to the entire country, actually executed for the entire country, implemented across the entire country. We knew the day after that it was implemented that there were going to be violations, and there have been. We've been very open and honest about that. Uh, we've tried very hard to prevent them where we can, and there have been some that have been prevented. And where they occur, uh, we try as best we can to analyze the information, share it, uh, and then try to use influence both on the opposition and on the regime uh, to keep them from happening again. Now, you're right, there were some uh, <clears throat> smaller reaffirmations of that or efforts to restore that uh, uh, over the last couple of weeks. And um, I'm, I'm not in a position now to, to, to say with any great certainty that that, that approach is going to um, – be pursued in the future. I, I, I wouldn't rule it in. I wouldn't rule it out. What I can affirmatively tell you is that the Secretary is committed to keeping the cessation of hostilities uh, in place as much as possible. Obviously, the goal here is zero viol violations. That's what we want. Um, and he will continue to work this very, very hard, certainly with Foreign Minister Lavrov, but also with other leaders in the uh, in the ISSG going forward. Um, and if, if that means that we have to take a look at more localized efforts in order to do that, then we'll do that. Um, obviously, the, the ideal approach is one that's nationwide and it's enduring and it's sustainable. Um, and I appreciate the desire to get me to speculate about, you know, another 48 hours or another 70, 72 hours or whatever it is, and I'm, I'm simply not prepared to do that. And I don't think it would be wise to, uh, to try to um, hypothesize about uh, the, the manner in which we might pursue additional efforts to keep the cessation in place. What matters, and I think, and I wish I'd said this to the first time you asked this question, but what <laughs> – <laughs> okay, I can't argue with that. Yeah. What, 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 what matters is that, um, that we have seen a reduction in violence and that – and I don't, I'm not overstating this by any stretch because Syria remains a dangerous place and there's still a lot of suffering. I, I, but, but that for some Syrians, in some places, life has gotten better. Not perfect. Uh, they still have a government that is obviously – showing a propensity to continue to kill them. Uh, but, but life has gotten measurably better for some Syrians in some places. And I don't think we should lose sight of that. Uh, it, uh, it, there is more work to be done. But uh, I can tell you the Secretary is committed uh, to being as flexible as he needs to be to keep the cessation in place. And then a couple on Iraq, um, <clears throat> if we can transition. Go ahead. Go ahead. Has the U.S. increased um, military personnel at the U.S. Embassy as a result of security concerns, um, brought in additional Marines? Um, can you confirm those reports? And secondly, if this is the case, is this um, a, a permanent increase in the number of um, military personnel who will be there for security reasons or a temporary upstaffing? Well, I think you know we don't talk about security posture at our embassies, and it's a, uh, it's, it's a dynamic situation. We constantly evaluate um, our security posture, and frankly, we routinely and constantly change that posture as appropriate. Um, that is uh, what we expect uh, uh, the, the good people in diplomatic security to do. I won't, I won't talk about it one way or another. I, will t I do think it's important to remind, however, that our embassy in Baghdad continues to operate normally. Is there um, – one more – is there – 
ongoing, is there concern in this building concerning the ongoing friction between the Iraqi government and uh, Muqtada al sadr's followers? I, I know that you've said before that this is, this is sort of inside baseball, an issue that Iraq has to work out. But is there concern that these tensions may be destabilizing to U.S. interests, such as the overall fight against the Islamic State? We want, obviously, to see the reforms that Prime Minister Abadi is putting into place. We want to see them succeed. And we know that he knows how important it is for him to continue uh, uh, pursuing these reforms in keeping with Iraq's constitution. Um, and Iraq is an important partner in the region. They are certainly an important partner in this fight against Daesh. Our support inside the coalition remains and will, uh, and will continue. That support is being uh, done, you know, by, with, and through the Abadi government uh, in Baghdad. Uh, but you're right. Look, these are uh, these are political challenges that uh, the Iraqi people um, have to work through, and Prime Minister Abadi has to lead them through. Um, and as I said earlier, a few days ago, you know, we're we're confident that uh, you know that he can do that, uh, and I, and and that he's well aware of uh, of the of the significant challenges he's facing. Sure. Are you concerned about the security around that embassy? We're concerned about the security of our embassies all over the world, everywhere. Samir? Yes. You said you talk daily to the Russians about Syria. Can you help us understand how do you assess their behavior in Syria? Because it doesn't seem they are using their influence very much on Assad because he, he keeps continuing bombing and violating uh, Cease fires. I mean, can he keep doing this without an orange light from the Russians? Without a what? Orange, 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 it's orange not light? A green orange light, at least. <laughs> I've never heard that phrase before. <laughs> uh, you know, look, I, I, I talked about this, uh, you know, the other day, that uh, we, we know that Russia's influence can matter, that it does matter to the Assad regime, because when, when we've seen them exert that influence, it has worked. And I think the reduction in violence in and around Aleppo over the last couple of days is a yet another indication, another uh, bit of evidence that, that when they exert their influence, um, it can have a meaningful impact. The question that we've asked ourselves is, you know, how much, how, how willing are they, uh, and how, how strongly are they using that influence at times, and whether or not Assad has developed any antibodies to some of that influence. Um, that has not always been clear. Uh, but again, if you just take a look at the last 48 hours, and the facts, Samir, quite frankly, that in many other places around Syria, the cessation has held. I mean, Aleppo gets a lot of attention, rightly so. Uh, no question about that. Um, but there are a lot of other communities around Syria that we're not talking about. You're not asking me about. Uh, because the cessation has held and the violence has stopped. So we know they can have influence and that that influence can have an impact. We want to see that continue. Idlib, for example, the... the the firing on the camp. It's in Idlib province, not in Aleppo. Yeah, so... So we, we are asking about other places. But, yeah, you're asking about other places where the cessation may not be holding. We're not talking about the places in Syria, which is what I was referring to, where it is holding. Because uh, I recognize, you know, that's not necessarily newsworthy. At least maybe not to some members of the media, but it certainly is to us. Because it shows that the cessation can, in fact, be put in place and held. Now, um, your question about Idlib, uh, in the question itself, it, you know, you're calling it a firing. As I said, we're still trying to assess what happened, and I don't have great uh, – we don't have any more specific knowledge uh, about what happened there, and so I, I think it's just, it's just too soon to say. Yeah. Can we move on? Yes. To, to yes. the Palestinian-Israeli issue. Uh, to the what? Palestinian Israeli issue. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, could I ask you? Uh, Said asks about other stuff. Madagascar. Well, I ask about other stuff. He does. He does. You're not going to ask about, ask about Ma but you're not going to ask about Madagascar okay. today, are you? Because yeah. I really don't have anything on that right now. It's a big island. Anyway, I wanted to ask you for the third day straight, uh, the host or you know, confrontations along the Gaza border. Are you concerned that this may escalate out of hand? Hamas is saying that they don't want war. They don't want for this hostility to, to, to accelerate anyway, uh, but the Israelis are not holding off. Are you talking to them about the need to... to, to well, we, look, we always talk to, to our Israeli counterparts about 
right. security there, and certainly. I understand, uh, but on this particular issue, have you spoken to I'm not going to, I won't detail specific yes. conversations that we're having with Israeli leaders. Uh, let me just say a couple of things. I think it's probably the same thing you've heard us say over the last couple of days. I mean, right. it is a developing situation. We obviously do not want to see it escalate. Um, and certainly we condemn, you know, mortar attacks and, and other attacks from Gaza into Israel. And I would also say, as we've said before, we support Israel's right to defend itself and to defend its citizens. And no country should have to be under threat uh, that comes uh, from attacks based on tunneling. Um, so, and there's a legitimate security concern here uh, for the Israeli government. What we would like to obviously see is that the, the tensions decrease and it doesn't get worse. Is there a line beyond which you expect the Israelis not to go? And, and, and affirming their self-defense? All I will say to that, Saeed, and what we said before, is we, okay. we want to see the violence come down. We want to see calm restored. We want to see both sides take affirmative steps and show some leadership to try to get us to a situation where you can have a meaningful discussion about a two-state solution. That's really, that's really what this is about, or needs to be about. I have a couple more questions. The Israelis keep holding uh, bodies of Palestinians that are killed at the checkpoint really is kind of macabre. I mean, you know, the, the brother and sister, for instance, that were killed on the 27th, their bodies are held. There are some, something like 14 or 15 others that are being held. And it, in a way, just to punish and torment the, the families. Do you have any comment on that? Is that a practice that should cease or should stop immediately? Because I, it doesn't seem to have any kind of investigative value. Well, look, without talking to the specifics uh, of any uh, case here, what I would tell you is that we would welcome steps uh, from the parties that would help to reduce the tensions and restore calm. And I, I just I think Including I'll leave it the release of, of the bodies of dead people? It, if, if a step like that, if, if a step like that could help reduce the tensions and restore calm, then obviously we would welcome that. Let me ask you one more question. Uh, the, the, the Congresswoman Betty McCollum from Minnesota's 4th District um, uh, drafted a letter and uh, she's trying to collect signatures and so on from her colleagues. Uh, it is addressed to President Obama, copy to Vice President Biden and Secretary of State Kerry. And she calls uh, for the establishment of a special envoy for the protection of Palestinian children. Is that something? Have you, first of all, have you seen this letter? We have not received the letter. I'm aware of it, aware. Uh, but I have not. We've not received it here. Mm -hmm. um, I certainly wouldn't speak for the White House and the manner in which they would respond. Obviously, uh, when the Secretary gets congressional correspondence, we, we try to respond uh, appropriately and as expeditiously as possible. Uh, we don't talk about the specifics of that. Um, and I'm not going to speculate about this particular proposal. I mean, I'm aware of what's in it. Uh, I, I'm, uh, although I've not seen the letter, we haven't received it. I'm certainly aware of the, uh, of the purported contents of it, and uh, I just wouldn't get ahead uh, speculate on, on a proposal like that at this time. Um, broadly speaking, uh, we don't want to see any children under any threat. Um, children should be allowed to live freely and grow up to live normal, productive, healthy, happy lives. That's a very controversial Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. You're going out on a limb. It's <laughs> true. It's true. And, uh, and as I said, we want to see affirmative steps by, by all the parties to restore the calm and the, and the movements <clears throat> forward here. But you also suggest that this, of course, uh, will be under your uh, auspices, so to speak, the, whatever special envoy and so on. And uh, she cites reason for engagement, knowing exactly what's going on on the ground. She cites that generation after generation of Palestinian children have grown up under occupation, a sense of despair, no opportunities, all these things. Things that you really agree with, it's things that you would uh, sort of, in fact, fall in place or mesh with your outline and your policies and so on for it. Anywhere, as a matter of fact, would that so? Why would you look uh, sort of uh, uh, positively at such a uh, suggestion? Well, again, um, as far as I know, we haven't gotten this letter, uh, and I've seen reports of it and reports of this proposal. So I, I really don't think it's wise to speculate about the specific proposal uh, that is purportedly in this letter. We haven't gotten it. It's as you said, it's not addressed to the secretary. It's addressed to the president. I'm not going to get ahead of how the White House would respond to this. Uh, but in general, obviously, we want to see um, the kinds of conditions uh, there that can move us forward to a two-state solution, a productive path forward here, and leadership on all, all sides to help us get there so that children on all sides 
uh, can live normal, happy, healthy lives. I mean, obviously, that's that's the whole reason why we still consider or still uh, f favor moving towards a two-state solution, so that there can be a more a p more peaceful future for kids. So now that we've nailed down that you're pro-child, um, which is always good to know, uh, can we move on to something else? Sure. And that is. Um, the secretary has often, when asked about um, the current political campaigns, um, demurred or only made very brief comments related to what he has heard from foreign leaders. This morning, he, uh, in his commencement address, um, went a bit further than he has in the past. Uh, he made a joke about um, the diverse graduate class, graduating class being Donald Trump's worst nightmare. He alluded to the carnival barker um, type campaigning. I'm just wondering, has he decided that he is going to weigh in or uh, on the campaign or in general on the, on, on the, on the season? No, I think the secretary was simply trying to uh, uh, in, enjoy a light moment with uh, the graduates. Um, and uh, it was really nothing more than that. He, as you know, um, has made it a point to stay out of uh, the political fray um, uh, as Secretary of State, and I don't see that changing. So this was it? It was just a, a, a one-off kind of uh, joke? Because he did get – it wasn't just the joke. It was the, it was more serious. About it. Well, in terms of – what's that? Carnival Barker hiding behind a wall. But he only mentioned Trump's name once. Well, look – uh, I mean, as a racist. What's that? Uh, he only mentioned him once to refer to him as a racist. He has repeatedly talked about the concerns that he hears from foreign leaders when we're uh, are traveling around the world, the concerns that they have expressed about the rhetoric on the campaign and the anxiety that some of that rhetoric is causing foreign leaders around the world. I mean, he's talked about that quite a bit. Um, I mean, he's not living in a bubble. He sees what's no, going no, on in there, and he's obviously concerned about some of the some of the tone right. and the effect that that's having on foreign leaders. My, but if you're asking me is, is you know, be, because he enjoyed a lighthearted moment with students today, is that going, is, is he changed his calculus now to, to, to more aggressively, you know, jump into, in, into active debates about what's going on on the campaign trail? The answer is no. Okay, so we should not expect him to carry you, on. You should not way. expect him to, uh, to, to change his view that as Secretary of State he needs to stay okay. and will stay out of the political fray. It's a lighthearted moment. He thinks that uh, Donald Trump's campaign is still a suitable subject of humor. It, it was a it was it was a, a joke intended to l lighten up uh, an audience of students that were graduating from college. Uh, Let me follow up on, on, on Trump because he also said that England would be better off without being a member of the European Union. Does that complicate your policies or, or your efforts in, in this regard? I'm not going to respond to uh, – yeah, now – Well, that's I've, just I've, part of the campaign rhetoric. I, I have and will continue to scrupulously avoid mm -hmm. engaging in a, a, a tit-for-tat for, for every comment made by every candidate uh, for political office. The, the, that, that's not appropriate uh, discussion from, from this podium, and I'm not going to engage in it. Um, the Secretary has said himself he believes in a strong UK in, in Europe and in the European Union. Uh, uh, the President Obama has spoken uh, very clearly about uh, our views in that regard, and I don't have anything more to add. Yeah, Jenny. John, thank you. Uh, do, do you know that the uh, UN Security Council press statement on North Korea, why they delayed it? I, I don't have uh, – an update for you on that, Jenny. I'm sorry. Can you take the question? I'll, I'll take a look. I'm not aware of a specific delay, so you're going to have to let me get back to you on that. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, today, several dozen armed men raided a mosque in Crimea and captured almost 100 Crimean Tatars. Later, later uh, the Tatars were freed, but they were told to come to police. Are you aware of that, and uh, do you have any reaction of such kind of religious persecution in Crimea? I'm not aware of those reports. I think uh, before I um, issue a comment here from the podium, you're going to have to let me uh, go back and get some more information on that. Um, so I, I think I'm just, if you don't mind, I'm going to just take your question and, and we'll get back to you on that. I'm going to refrain. 
right now until we can get more information about what happened here. Guys, I'm going to have to get going, I'm afraid. Thank you very much.